Okay, hello everyone. Uh, oh, well done. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, your 500 million year family tree. Uh, just a few thank yous before uh, to the Paleontological Association for nominating me and uh, to the University of Manchester for giving me some time off to come down. So uh, I'm going to start with this pretty astounding fact. You are actually a fish. Uh, and to find out how we are a fish, uh, we're going to take a whirlwind tour uh, 500 million years deep into our family trees uh, to look at our fishy heritage. Uh, but first, we're going to start a bit closer to home. Uh, so this is uh, a human embryo at 14 days old. It might not look like a human, but uh, uh, trust me, it is. Uh, and actually, we can draw some close comparison here with uh, a fish already at this stage. So this is a shark embryo at a similar stage of development, and we can see that they're strikingly similar. Uh, the first thing to illustrate uh, is the series of uh, ridges and slits that just sit behind the head, and these are called the pharyngeal arches. In sharks, these pharyngeal arches develop, the first arch develops into the jaws, uh, and then the preceding uh, ridges develop into the uh, cartilage gill supports. Uh, the slits develop into the gills, the gill slits. In humans, again, the first uh, ridge uh, becomes the lower jaw, and then the preceding ridges become uh, facial nerves in the neck and the jaws. Uh, another similarity between the human embryo and a fish embryo are these paired structures. Uh, so these are the paired limb buds. And at this stage in development, they look a lot like fins. And if we compare them to paired fin buds, so this is the pectoral fin, so this, uh, equivalent to your arms, uh, they are quite similar. Not only are they structurally similar, but they are developmentally similar. So these things are developing in a very similar way. This is a really elegant exp uh, experiment where a target gene has been attached with a fluorescent marker. So uh, where we see the green color, we know that this uh, target gene is, be is being expressed, is being activated. Uh, and we see uh, on the right, uh, in the fingers, the digits of the mouse, uh, this target gene is being expressed. And in the same position in the zebrafish fin, uh, it's being expressed, it's being activated in these uh, fin webs, in the, the supports for the fin web. So uh, why do uh, fish embryos, like the shark embryo and human embryos, have these striking similarities? Well, to find out, we need to take a trip deep into our family tree. Uh, so we'll start the clock with uh, 10 million years on the time scale. Uh, and this is a uh, time scale in which we can view our closest relatives. This is me, by the way. Uh, with uh, chimpanzees and with gorillas. So 10 million years is kind of a difficult time uh, period to visualize, such a massive amount of time. And I like to use a little trick whereby, if you imagine a sheet of paper uh, is, represents one year, and so like the longest human lifespan, about 100 years, would be just a centimeter off the ground. 10 million years would be a stack of paper much taller than the tallest building, Burj Khalifa. Uh, and absolutely dwarfing the Brighton i360. Uh, so we can see that uh, we share a common ancestor here with chimpanzees at about seven and a half million years, and just under eight million years we have a common ancestor with gorillas as well. But we still haven't got to the fish yet, so we need to uh, put some more time on our time scale. So we. Oh, uh, just to illustrate, these are some human fossils. Uh, so this is uh, Homo erectus, uh, Homo habilis, and this is uh, Australopithecus. So this is the famous Lucy fossil. Uh, and we see that these are quite close relatives, about five, about three million years. 
So we put some more time on our time scale. We're now up to a 100 million year time scale. Uh, and again, returning to our paper analogy, this would be a stack of paper towering over Mount Everest. Uh, so we can have a look at some more distant relatives. Uh, first, the primates, and we share a common ancestor with primates at about 70 million years. Uh, with rodents at about 80. Uh, with a whole group of mammals, including cats and dogs, and uh, dolphins and cows, at about 85. And with some weirder mammals like elephants, uh, sloths and armadillos uh, down here at about 90, 92. Uh, we still haven't got to fish, so we're going to have to travel deeper into our evolutionary history. Uh, these mammals, by the way, are uh, united together by uh, the presence of a placenta. So the, this is a group of mammals that uh, all share a placenta when they're uh, young, they're developing. So these are our closest mammal relatives. So we're going further back in time, down to 500 million years. Uh, and we can look at some of our closest relatives. But first, returning to our uh, paper analogy. So 500 million years is a absolutely colossal uh, chunk of time. If it was a stack of paper, it would be 50 kilometers high, five times higher than uh, your average uh, commercial airline flies, and it's actually halfway to the edge of space. So we've really gone deep into our evolutionary past here. Uh, so some of our closest relatives on this time scale are birds, lizards, and amphibians. And together, uh, this group of animals, including mammals, is called the tetrapods which literally means uh, four feet. Tetrapods uh, are uh, characterized by their limbs. Uh, so we have two arms and two legs. And each of these limbs has a specific pattern of bones. So you see a pattern from one bone to two bones, the radius and ulna, uh, to many bones, so the wrist and the digits, the fingers. And you see the same pattern regardless of the animal. So the same in birds, same in a horse, same in a turtle. Uh, another characteristic of tetrapods is that they have a neck. So you see here the shoulder girdle of this crocodile is highlighted, and in front of it there is a uh, vertebral column separating the head from the shoulder girdle. In other words, a neck. But in the fish, the shoulder girdle attaches directly to the head with no neck. So we can travel deeper into our past and meet our first fish relative. So these are the ray finned fishes. And ray finned fishes are incredibly diverse group of organisms. In fact, on a species level, they account for more than half of vertebrate diversity. Everything from a uh, marlin, pikes, flying fishes, seahorses, and these ugly angler fishes. Uh, so there's absolutely thousands of uh, ray finned fishes. Uh, ray finned fishes and tetrapods together comprise a group we call the bony fishes, which unsurprisingly have bony skeletons, as their name alludes to. They also have a particular uh, pattern of bone in their skulls. So, uh, we've got some skulls of some fishes at the top and some uh, skulls of a crocodile, a lizard, and a human. Uh, and we see in each of these skulls we have a dentary bone making the lower jaw, a maxilla making much of the upper jaw, uh, a premaxilla, which in humans just makes the front of the jaw here, and a jugal. This is a cheekbone. So in fishes and in tetrapods, we have the same pattern of bones. Uh, so we share an ancestor with these ray finned fishes, uh, everything from the flying fish to the seahorse, down here about uh, 430 million years ago. Our next uh, relative, our very distant cousin, are the sharks. We share an ancestor with sharks 
about 450 million years ago. Sharks come in lots of flavours, uh, the rays, uh, camouflaged wobbegongs, filter feeding bas giants like the basking shark, and of course great big predators like the great white. But they all have uh, the same body plan, or very similar body plans. They have a cartilage skeleton, so unlike the bony fishes, a skeleton is made out of flexible cartilage, the same stuff that makes your nose wobble at the end. Uh, but their skin is covered in these little uh, denticles, these tooth-like structures. Uh, and if we compare the shark skin here to human teeth, we see they're very structurally similar. And indeed, the shark skin is largely made up, the shark's denticles is largely made up of dentine, the same stuff that makes up your teeth. So if you go to the dentist with a sensitive tooth, it's because you've got your dentine exposed. Uh, teeth are also capped with a layer of enamel, and in the shark's skin, uh, there's a capping layer of an enamel-like tissue. So sharks, uh, together with the bony fishes, make up a colossal group of vertebrates called the jawed vertebrates which, unsurprisingly, have jaws. Uh, they also have teeth. The so teeth are very special organs. Uh, they're made of dentine with this uh, capping layer of enamel or enamel-like tissue. Uh, and the key thing about teeth is that they're replaced during life, which is a very uh, special uh, type of skeletal tissue. Uh, jawed vertebrates also have paired fins, as we've mentioned before, paired pectoral fins, equivalent to our arms, and paired pelvic fins, equivalent to our legs. Uh, jawed vertebrates have vertebrae, so this series of segmentally repeating bones that make up our backbone. Uh, and they have paired nostrils. So everyone gets very obsessed with the fact that if you look at the underside of a ray, it looks like they're a smiley face. These uh, eyes, though, are their paired nostrils. Uh, it's a characteristic all jawed vertebrates share. But we haven't reached the end of our vertebrate tree yet. There's one more group I'd like to introduce you to, uh, and they are my favourite group. So these are the jawless fishes. Uh, and we share an ancestor with jawless fishes right down here at 500 million years. So first I'd like to introduce you to the lamprey, if you haven't met lampreys before. So this is the adult, but lampreys have a biphasic lifestyle. So they start off as uh, larvae and they're tiny little things that filter feed. So they eat microscopic uh, particles in the water column. Uh, but as they metamorphose, uh, they become these jawless horrors. Uh, they develop this large sucker-like mouth lined with what look like teeth, but they are not actually true teeth. They're made out of keratin, the same kind of uh, tissue that makes up your hair. Uh, what they do with these sucker-like mouths is quite frightening. They are parasites, and they feed on uh, unsuspecting prey like this fish. Uh, they attach on with their sucker mouths and rasp away at the flesh using a barbed tongue. And they feed on the blood and the uh, tissue leaving puncture-like wounds on the poor, unsuspecting fishes or unsuspecting anglers. <laughs> well, I quite like this photo because you can see one of the lamprey's other characteristics. This opening here is the nostril of the lamprey on the top of the head. And unlike jawed vertebrates, lampreys only have one single nostril. They also have a cartilage skeleton, like the sharks, uh, but unlike the sharks, they don't have a vertebral column, uh, so they don't have a backbone. Instead, they just have this uh, rod of, car of cartilage uh, called a notochord. You can see it here in the cross-section, just a single rod of cartilage. As bad as lampreys are, they are nowhere near as disgusting as these guys. So these are the hagfish. Uh, and you might be confused for thinking that this is a worm. And indeed, when these guys were first described uh, by the famous uh, 
scientist Carl von Linnaeus. Uh, he thought that these were indeed worms and classified them along with the earthworms. But these are, of course, vertebrates, and horrible vertebrates at that. So lampreys live deep uh, under the sea, the sea floor, and they feed on rotting flesh. Their particular favorite delicacy is uh, decaying whales. Uh, they have this amazing ability to tie themselves in knots so they can prize rotting flesh from the whale bones. And they rasp at it, much like the lamprey, with these horny keratin teeth. But perhaps the most famous uh, ability of the hagfish uh, is uh, their ability to produce slime. So when they're agitated, they release some proteins into the water column. And these swiftly react with the surrounding water to produce viscous slime. Uh, and this gives uh, hagfish their uh, common name of slime eels. Uh, so yeah, quite disgusting. But this all has a purpose. So uh, in this experiment, we can see a hagfish here feeding on some rotten fish bait. And along comes a big uh, shark. I think it's a seven-gilled shark. And it thinks, oh, tasty hagfish but then immediately lets it go and starts opening and closing its mouth rapidly and swims away. So what happened? Uh, if we look at the uh, slow motion replay, we see it's uh, biting and then it starts flushing its mouth. It's because the hagfish has become agitated, released the proteins into the shark's mouth, clogging up the gills. So the shark has to flush its gills out with water or it'll risk suffocation. So it's a really effective defense measure. Uh, I couldn't resist putting this bit in. Surprisingly, both of these fishes are on the uh, dinner table. So lampreys is actually a delicacy reserved for the coronation of a monarch in Great Britain. So every time a new monarch is coronated, the county of Gloucestershire uh, breaks them a lamprey pie. But monarchs beware, because uh, Henry I, King of England, died of a surflet of lampreys. Apparently he got food poisoning, so be at risk. But worse, much worse than the lampreys are the hagfish, which are only eaten in Korea. So I've got some excerpts from uh, the hagfish cookbook on Wikibooks, which I'm going to read because they're delightful. So to prepare them, they are sliced down the middle to remove the digestive tract, then marinated in a sauce used for Korean barbecue. Traditionally, the raw fish are then placed on a heated plate at the center of a table where they are cooked and served. The cooked fish are moved to the side of the dish with lettuce and gochujang red chili paste, no amount of which can mask the animal's distinct taste. <laughs> and even worse than that, the hagfish produce large amounts of mucus as a protective measure and can be made to produce more by placing them in a bucket and agitating the animal until it is filled. The resulting slime can then be used as a substitute for egg whites. I'm yet to make a hagfish meringue, but it's on the menu. So lampreys and hagfish challenge somewhat our notion of what a vertebrate is. Uh, if you ask... Uh, if you think about vertebrates, you normally think about a backbone, maybe a mineralized skeleton, uh, bone, and maybe teeth. But hagfish have none of these features. So we have to ask ourselves, what actually is a vertebrate? What defines vertebrates? Well, to find out, we have to compare jawed vertebrates and jawless vertebrates to their closest uh, invertebrate relative. So this little wormy-like thing is called a lancelet and it's a little filter-feeding invertebrate, uh, closely related to true vertebrates. And if we look inside at these things, uh, we see only jawed vertebrates have these uh, skeletal characters, so a backbone, uh, supports for the gills, and a mineralized skull. But uh, jawless vertebrates and jawed vertebrates share a number of characters not found in the lancelet, uh, including a brain, uh, eyes, uh, liver and heart and a gallbladder. So these uh, organs, these soft characteristics, are what define vertebrates. It's not a backbone or a skull or any of those things you commonly associate with vertebrates. So we have our 
uh, vertebrate family tree, stretching back all the way to 500 million years. But we're left with these large gaps. Uh, so it's quite difficult to imagine how something like a lamprey evolves into something like a jawed vertebrate, or how something like a bony fish evolves into a tetrapod. And the reason we have these gaps is because the animals, the vertebrates that filled these gaps, have long since become extinct. And so if we want to un get a better understanding of our vertebrate family tree, we need to look at the fossil record. Uh, the right age rocks to look at are these early Paleozoic rocks. So rocks stretching back from about 350 million years all the way back to 500 million years. Uh, any older than this, and these organisms that we're looking for haven't quite evolved yet. Any later than this, and they've already gone extinct. Fortunately, in Great Britain, there are lots of rocks of the right age. Uh, so it turns out, in Great Britain at least, that early Silurian and Devonian age rocks, so the green and the orange here, around 400 million years old, uh, are the best place to find these fossil fishes. Uh, and you can find them here in Shropshire and Herefordshire and in the Scottish Lowlands as well. And if you know... Oh, I forgot this bit. Uh, so the, uh, the Devonian world is a pretty different place to what it was like today. Um, it was tropical, so Great Britain was in a tropical climate, but uh, woody plants hadn't evolved yet. Plants had only recently common, uh, colonized the uh, land, and so the plant life was relatively simple, like these branching forms. But in the seas, uh, there were abundant life, uh, including these giant sea scorpions, and these really were giant sea scorpions. They got up to three meters long, much longer than a man. Uh, so it was a pretty dangerous place to be an early fish. So if you know where to look, uh, you can go quarrying, uh, looking for fossil fishes. Uh, I think both of these are in Shropshire. Uh, and the first fish I want to introduce you to uh, is these guys. These are called heterostracans. Uh, and heterostracans uh, are characterized by their big bony head shields. They have these big mineralized head shields and uh, uh, fins at the back, tails covered in scales. They don't have paired fins, the paired front fins, the pectoral fins, or the back fins, the pelvic fins. But heterostracans are really important because they are the earliest fish uh, where we see evidence of this mineralized skeleton, which is such an important characteristic of most vertebrates. And so I was interested in these guys during my PhD, and I wanted to learn more about their skeletons, because surprisingly, uh, we didn't know a great deal about uh, how their skeletons were built. So I wanted to peer at, inside these skeletons in really high detail. So I traveled here to the Swiss light source, which is a synchrotron, a uh, kind of particle accelerator that accelerates electrons to near the speed of light. And from there, we can generate high energy X-rays to use just like a, a CT scanner in a hospital uh, to produce uh, 3D models of the skeletons of these ancient fishes. So here's me during my PhD days, sans beard. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this little tiny dot here uh, is the fossil I'm scanning. So it's only a tiny little bit of the scale uh, that I'm scanning uh, using these high energy x-rays. Uh, and this look of concentration on my face is because if I so much as tap this bit of equipment on the left, on the right, sorry, uh, I'd probably have to be owing the Swiss light source a few thousand pounds. So uh, working at the Swiss Light Source is an interesting uh, uh, experience. You work for about two or three days, and it's, uh, you have the beam line constantly. So you work in seven or eight hour shifts, normally during the middle of the night. So this is a time lapse of a seven hour shift. You see the light in the corner here going from red to green. Uh, every time it's red, it's scanning. Uh, and it's uh, in a lead-lined uh, uh, door because the x-rays would be fatal if you were in there. So every time people go in, we have to do this safety check to make sure no one's hiding under the cupboards and about to be zapped to death. 
So that was about yeah, seven hours of scanning time condensed into a couple of minutes. Uh, and this is the kind of data that we can get out from this uh, uh, super powerful microscope. So we get a series of 2,000 of these slices uh, through, the, uh, through the scales and bony plates that we were scanning. Uh, using these slices, we can build three-dimensional models of our scales and bony plates that we can dissect in any orientation, just as if we were doing a dissection on uh, a bit of bone from a living animal. We can also stack these slices together and produce these virtual thin sections so to more completely visualize the spaces inside the bone. So these branching structures are dentine, so they're just like the dentine tubules that make your teeth sensitive. These would have housed cells. We can even uh, extract more uh, detailed and more uh, intricate structures from these scans. So this is a model produced by filling in the spaces inside the bone, and this models the vasculature, the blood vessels that would have run through the scales and the bone. And these blue things, which are only a one or two micrometers uh, in width, so a tenth of a millimeter, are collagen fiber bundles, so mineralized bits of protein that help build up your skeleton. And the results of this work suggest that actually the bones of these early fishes uh, were really very similar to the bones in a human. So this is a human skull bone and a heterostracan skull bone. And you can see both of them have uh, three layers, two uh, outer layers laminated, and an inter inner layer, uh, which is this spongy bone. So bone hasn't really changed that much uh, over 500 million years. So using all this uh, anatomical data, we can place our fossil in our evolutionary tree. Uh, and we know that it groups with these other vertebrates to the exclusion of the lamprey because it has, like these other vertebrates, a skeleton made out of bone and dentine. So the next guy I want to introduce you to is uh, osteostracans. So these have uh, characteristic horseshoe-shaped heads that come in many varieties, including uh, star-shaped ones, ones with bull horns, and my particular favorite, this one's called spatulaspis, because it's got a spatula-shaped head. Uh, and one of the amazing things about these fossils is that their head is so extensively mineralized, they're basically solid bits of bone, uh, that you can grind them up. Uh, and if you take note and draw or take a photograph of each of the, uh, of the sections through the skull as you're grinding it away, you can actually build a model of uh, the space where the brain would have sat. So this is exactly what this guy, Eric Stencio, did in the 1920s. And he, he built this fantastic model out of wax of an ancient fish brain. Uh, these days, you can do the same thing with a synchrotron, so that powerful microscope that I used earlier. Uh, and you can build 3D models that you can dissect and look at the internal structures of. So these yellow bits here are the inner ears of this fish brain. Uh, and one of the key characteristics of these osteostracans is that they have uh, paired fins. So at the front of their, next to their heads, they have these paired pectoral fins uh, that are equivalent to our arms. So again, we can, uh, based on these bits of data, we can place this fossil on our family tree. Uh, and so these groups are grouped together by the presence of uh, these front fins, these pectoral fins, which are missing in the heterostracans and in the lampreys and the hagfish. So the next fossil I want to introduce you to are the placoderms, uh, which come in a variety of flavors again, ones uh, that look like a turtle, ones that look more like sharks, uh, ray-shaped ones, and these weird kite-shaped ones. And uh, these guys got absolutely enormous. 
So uh, if I could borrow a volunteer. I've prepared a size diagram for you. I was hoping to bring some fossils from the Natural History Museum. They've uh, let me down. Right, if you hold on to that end. So this is the size of this fossil. It's called Dunkelosteus. Uh, and it was one of the largest placoderms and one of the largest predators alive at the time. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> there we go. So this would have really been a uh, uh, top predator. And its jaws could open to almost 90 degrees, making it a bone crusher, preying on all those uh, fishes I mentioned earlier. Uh, by my reckoning, I think this is probably a subadult. I based it on a specimen, I think, in Chicago. But I think they probably got about twice this big, probably around six meters long, which would have been really frightening. Right, that's a... Uh Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll throw this away now. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. So uh, these placoderms had a number of features not found in the other fishes. Uh, they have jaws, so all the other fishes that we've uh, talked about were jawless. These guys were the first to uh, evolve jaws. They also have the paired pelvic fins, so these back fins, and they have teeth, uh, this uh, crucial characteristic uh, of tooth replacement, allowing them to maintain sharp teeth for crunching our ancestors. Um, we can place uh, placoderms again on our family tree. Uh, and placoderms are grouped with these other vertebrates uh, by the presence of jaws, of pelvic fins, uh, and teeth. Finally, uh, I'd like to talk to you about one more fossil. And this one was found uh, was a bit more difficult to find than the others that I've mentioned. Uh, but it's a really good example of how science works and of how uh, paleontology works. So we knew uh, what kind of aged rocks we were looking at to find this fossil in. And it just so happens that Ellesmere Island uh, in the uh, northern Canada, in the Canadian Arctic, uh, has a lot of exposed rock of this particular age. So it seems reasonable to assume that if you spent a lot of field seasons out there looking for fossils, you would eventually find uh, a fossil that meets uh, the criteria we're looking for. And that's exactly what a team from Chicago did for a number of years, and eventually turned up this amazing fossil fish called Tiktaalik. So Tiktaalik is a large fish, about three and a half meters long, three meters long. Uh, its name is actually taken from the Inuit word for large fish. Uh, but it's a kind of strange fish in that it has a um, a mixture of tetrapod-like characters, so land vertebrate-like characters, and fish-like characters. So if we look at its fin, uh, it has this one bone to two bones to many bones uh, uh, pattern in its fin, uh, much like a, a tetrapod hand, uh, but it also has this fin web covering the limb. So it was the fin which uh, grew like a limb, uh, and the scientists at Chicago have also looked at the wrist bones and worked out that these could actually articulate and so move together just like a wrist and were probably capable of supporting some of its weight. So it could do press-ups using its front fins. Uh, it also has a neck. So it's a fish with a neck. Uh, its shoulder girdle attaches behind the head and there's a vertebral column in between. Uh, and the evolution of a neck explains... Uh, the evolution of a neck from fishes that had no neck explains one of the strangest quirks in our biology, and that is the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So this nerve, uh, which comes down here and up here to connect to the larynx. 
Uh, if you were to design this nerve, which comes from the brain, there's no way that you'd take it all the way down into the thorax and back up to the larynx. You'd do the direct path, but it does this weird detour, which in humans is only a slight detour, but in a giraffe or a great big dinosaur, it's an absolutely ridiculous detour of like several meters, making it one of the largest cells in the body. Uh, this is explained when we look at the uh, evolution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So in fish, the equivalent of this nerve is this fourth branch of the vagus nerve, uh, which supplies the gills, uh, gill slit five, and the dorsal and the aortic arch six. Uh, when tetrapods evolved a larynx and a neck, uh, this nerve ha was still constrained by going through the sixth aortic arch. And so as the neck extended gradually, uh, so too did the recurrent laryngeal nerve around this aortic arch. Uh, and it's a good example of how evolution works. It's not like designing a car, it's like modifying a car whilst still keeping that car running at all, the t at all times. So we can place uh, our fossil, Tiktaalik, here on the tree, filling this gap between the ray fin fishes and the tetrapods. Uh, and these uh, animals here, these vertebrates, are grouped by having a neck and having these one, two repeating bone pattern in their limbs. So now we have this uh, more complete family tree, thanks to the fossils, we can start to uh, have a look at how our bodies evolved through time. So uh, back here, our common ancestor with uh, lampreys and hagfish, about 500 million years, uh, our ancestor had a heart, a brain, and a liver. As we move up the tree, our ancestor with heterostracans had uh, a skeleton made of bone and dentine. Further up, uh, with our common ancestor with osteostracans, had pectoral fins, these front fins that would become our arms. Moving up again, placoderms have uh, jaws and teeth and the pelvic fins, the back fins. Uh, our common ancestor with uh, the bony fishes uh, had a bony internal skeleton. So the in internal skeleton, most of our skeleton today, is made out of bone. Uh, our common ancestor with Tiktaalik had a neck and had wrists. And finally, our common ancestor with all land vertebrates living today had uh, true limbs uh, with digits, with fingers and toes. So this family tree explains the similarities between the shark embryo and the human embryo. These structures that are shared between both embryos are relics of our shared evolutionary ancestry. And these structures have been repurposed in humans and other land vertebrates for life uh, on land. So the take home message of all of this is that you are a fish. Uh, you might be a strange uh, fish that's evolved to live on land over millions of years, but you're a fish nonetheless. And the clues to your uh, evolutionary heritage as a fish are found throughout your body. So thank you for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>